afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first Sieges Brief of the winter 2022 term. We're excited to be back with you. We're going to kick off this semester by diving into she, he, they, navigating pronouns in gendered languages. So I am Ashton Troxel. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm an intercultural programs advisor at CGES, and I'm joined by my amazing co-hosts. Hi, I'm Stephen Gonzalez. I am the communication specialist here at CGES, and my pronouns are he, him, his. And I am Callie Rouse. I am also uh, one of the intercultural program advisors at CGES, and my, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And before we get started today, we'd like to remind everyone that we are not experts. We are here to just facilitate a conversation. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat and we will monitor that throughout. And without further ado, I will hand it off to Steven to talk about why this topic matters. Yes, so uh, you may have realized, or you may realize now, <laughs> that cultural nuances of gender may be different and you may experience a, cult a culture shift uh, especially if you are non-binary, transgender, or gender non-conforming. Um, so we do have a lot to think about, right, prior to our departure uh, in terms of inclusivity. And depending on what that even means for you, uh, you may experience uh, some sort of internalized tension when having to speak uh, a second language that might be gendered, such as French, Spanish, Russian, uh, or Hindi, uh, where most of the nouns are either male or female. Uh, there's a really interesting article uh, that we've included at the end of the uh, at the end of this presentation on a resource slide uh, that talks about how gendered languages may have uh, created gender prejudice. Uh, an example from it uh, stated from that study uh, that examined 630 billion words uh, across 45 different gendered languages, uh, and it showed that these gendered languages were most likely uh, you know, showed skewed associations uh, with more positive terms uh, being associated with men than with women, thus shaping how people may even view gender. Uh, additionally, if you are trying to be inclusive of people who may be non-binary or gender non-conforming, or you yourself are non-binary or gender non-conforming, you may want to research what your host country is doing to be more inclusive of they, them pronouns. Uh, which we will be talking about uh, as we continue this presentation. Uh, and then lastly, um, articulating meaning in a second language. And what we mean that what we mean by that is, uh, you know, communicating your identity here in the States is already hard enough and having to do it in a second language can be even more challenging, which we'll also have an example from later on in this later on in this presentation. But this is also certainly something that you're going to want to consider prior to departure. And with that, I will hand it off uh, for the next slide. So just so we are on the same page, we just wanted to do a quick review of uh, types of languages. So natural gender, like English and Swedish, objects are it, and people and animals are assigned a gender. And then gendered languages are going to be your romance languages, like French, Spanish, Portuguese, um, also German, and then I think Stephen mentioned Hindi. So there are some um, languages all over the world that are gendered, meaning that people, animals, objects are gendered, and then the way that we describe those people have to be tailored to that gender. Um, so it is pretty complex. And then there's also a genderless um, category. So Mandarin and Finnish are good examples of those. So no nouns have gender and the same word is used for he and she. But that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that the culture is um, inclusive, even though on the surface level, the language may seem to be. And we'll dive into that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about gendered languages and really doing your research before you go to a country. As Stephen mentioned, you know, talking about ourselves and our identity can be really difficult to do in, in English, but when you go to France or you go to Argentina or Brazil, you're going to try, you know, try to explain these nuances about yourself in your second language can be 
really challenging, especially if you don't understand, you know, the political landscape or the social context of um, not fitting into, uh, you know, society's binary gender. So in a lot of countries, having more inclusive language is really coming out of equality movements that have started in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and it really started as a feminist activism. Um, as Stephen mentioned, a lot of words and importance were given to uh, the masculine, or there are some words that, uh, uh, like for example, a council person in France, the word to describe that person is masculine. So it's almost like only men can hold that position. Um, and it's not for females. So that's really where, when the equality movement started. So getting more inclusivity in language, there's a lot of reliance on activists um, and it's very political. For example, in France, um, the minister of education said that they cannot teach inclusive language in schools. Um, so that has a huge impact on society because language is so important. It frames our thoughts and our um, imagination. So this is really important to look into before you, you're going abroad. Um, there's also different governing bodies for different types of languages like l'Académie Française for French and the Royal Spanish Academy for Spanish. And they really don't wanna change the rules. They wanna uphold um, the language as it has been for hundreds of years and are really hesitant to change. But there, there is some movement happening. For example, in Argentina, some textbooks have been reprinted with uh, Spanish inclusive language and the president will often give speeches using inclusive language. So even though the Royal Spanish Academy doesn't recognize the inclusive language, there is movement being made in countries all over the world, which I think is exciting. And another thing to note that inclusive writing is a lot easier to see on paper, and it could be a little bit more difficult to articulate when speaking, and it could be even more challenging trying to learn how to you know, conjugate verbs um, and describe pe people in the appropriate gender, learning how to be inclusive on top of you know, how the Académie Française wants you to learn French. So just keep in mind that things are progressing very slowly in, in different countries around the world, but looking at the full landscape, the political, the social, for example, education policies to see, you know, what the country you're going to is going to be like, um, and you're going to be in different um, domains of acceptance and knowledge, just like you are here in the U.S., like being at U of M is, can be really inclusive, but if you go to a small town, even in English, you're going to be having, you know, these conversations of explaining, you know, your pronouns or your gender identity. So those are, that's a little bit about gendered language. Uh, Callie's gonna talk about neutral and genderless languages. Yeah, so um, generally, you know, when you hear the kind of like the terms of like natural gendered or genderless languages, um, it sounds like it's going to be kind of like a bit of a smoother ride. Um, it does not have that element of like every single sentence you speak is it has gender embedded in it, but it still can be very much shown in how people speak and communicate with each other because gender is something that we are dealing with everywhere, um, regardless of the languages we speak. And um, a couple of instances of where this shows up and something to think about um, if you're going to a country with like natural gendered or genderless language is thinking about um, that even though they may not, you know, if they say like the point, like they point over to person over there and they say that person, um, when you're speaking about, you know, more specifics um, and things like that, you would, for example, say your male supervisor is a boss and your female supervisor is a female or woman boss. And so it becomes embedded in the language in different ways. So maybe it wouldn't be saying like, like he is 
my boss when that's where it would be in English whereas like this person is my female boss <laughs> basically is how it would come out in China and in uh, Mandarin and we see this in English of course um, I mean for example if you're talking about going to a restaurant you probably say either this is my waitress or this is my waiter um, and or like the stewardess um, and a flight attendant I think is the kind of a more gender neutral term that we've been gearing towards but still plenty of people say stewardess us and people saying ma'am or sir or are you mr or ms um and so it can be important also if you're going to these countries to kind of look into what way does gender embed itself in the language in less obvious ways um because it isn't as present in every every single thing you say. Um, and particularly for natural gendered language in general languages, you kind of want to look into um, the existence of they them pronouns and how someone would distinguish themselves as a person who uses they them pronouns or you know does not fit like a gen like a, a, tr a traditional gender presentation and how would they would be perceived. Um, and this we would be something you'd be um, it would be good to research for all locations. So next, I'm actually going to share a quote um, from one of our students. It is a little small, so I will read it out to you guys. Um, but this is one of our students who actually um, went on a program, I want to say in 2019 or so, in Brazil. Uh, so I am genderqueer and I use they them pronouns in English. There is no gender neutral pronoun in Portuguese, um, which as we mentioned before, it's pretty common. Um, and I was nervous um, about this the second I decided to do the program and I decided I would go with ella, uh, she in Portuguese while I was there. But in English, I would want the people traveling with me to know uh, to use they, them. And this is actually a strategy we mentioned uh, a little bit later on of potentially kind of figuring out whether you want to, um, um, how you want to present and who you want to present to um, in as they, them, or um, she or he. Um, for the most part, this went okay for me, especially because of the other gender queer people I met in Brazil and became friends with. Despite the violent and homophobic trans uh, slash transphobic political climate, I was able to find really beautiful people that supported um, that I could and that I could support in return on the trip. Um, they explained that people are just are trying to change the language in small ways right now. So there is no they, them, but instead of gendering adjectives with an A or an O at the end, people begun putting an E. And um, for the Brazilians I got closest to did their best to do this in Portuguese, and those that spoke English well even tried to use they, them. Having people who understood and could make me feel validated, even in this different culture, was hugely important, and I did not know uh, what I would have done without them. And I think one thing we're noticing also, I think in French and Spanish as well, um, is the use of E as a gender neutral marker as well. Isn't that right, Asha, for French? Or is it something else entirely? Yeah, there are different ways that the French are doing it. Um, and I think every, every country may do their own spin on it because it is very regional as well, especially since it's not recognized by these governing bodies. So perhaps if these um, people who have the final say of the rules could change it and make it universal, um, then someone in France versus someone in Cameroon who are both speaking French could be inclusive and they could follow the same rules of inclusivity as well. Yeah, that's a good note. I didn't even think about, because I think we're more familiar because we were more um, interact with like the Latin American, Mexican culture and things like that, that Latina and things like that are more common, but I actually don't know if Spain Spanish handles it differently than um, like Mexican Spanish. Interesting. Um, and so a final thing um, that they said was that said, this experience was not easy in this regard. Some days were better than others, but more often than not, 
when people translated, um, I uh, people translated, I was speaking, or sorry, uh, not when when people translated, I was she, understandably. Um, I often felt like I had to go along with this because one, asking people to change to they, them in their second language when I cannot speak Portuguese at all felt like a big ask. Two, we had a lot of short interactions with people and going out of their way to come out uh, to everyone all the time and ask for my pronouns would be exhausting and unhelpful. And three, I was often in situations where I did not feel be, feel safe being out, especially when my friends that do not misgender me were not around. This was difficult for me and could even be worse for others. Um, I particularly, I know this is a long quote, but I particularly wanted to keep this part in because of the, like, the recognition of, um, you know, asking people to do things in, in a secondary language and um, bringing a new concept in while also being like respectful that like you're in their space. Um, and actually transitioning to the next slide, I think this uses a lot of main touches on a, a, a lot of the strategies we would recommend to our students who are going to be out um, or thinking about being out as non-binary, um, transgender, or gender non-conforming abroad. So as the student demonstrated, there isn't a right way to do it. Um, so it could be that you are just out with your peers that are um, on the same program with you, but you're not out with any locals or like you're only out with some very trusted locals. Um, there are, and it's also okay if you wanna just like completely go by like he, him the entire time and just not wanna like deal with it. Um, it's really up to you and up to your comfort level. And um, it's good to kind of like gauge on um, where you wanna be. And it's okay if it's like different from person to person. And it's also really helpful to find allies. So finding classmates that can support you, they can help make you feel safe if you don't feel as safe in this country. Um, maybe connecting with host family or housemates, local organizations. Um, it's really can be helpful to look in a, ahead and like see, uh, for example, you know, like it seems like there is a decent like size community of folks that uh, the student was able to find in Brazil. Looking ahead and seeing if you could find people who could connect to you and share your same identity um, could be a great way of combining um, you know, finding like a culture and finding community in the country, as well as um, being able to learn more about how do we present that third option, you know, in another country. Because um, it, it looks so different based on even if they speak the same language, English, it's still probably very, you know, it could be very different in, in other English speaking location versus here. Um, it's also really important to learn about local attitudes, um, like the, the local LGBT community, like I mentioned, and laws in the area. Um, so like the student mentioned, Brazil isn't necessarily very friendly um, with trans individuals and, um, it can be really important to kind of know like what are the boundaries of being safe and um, you know what, uh, what how open you should be and how um, and, wh and what people you should trust. Um, and it also can be helpful to ask around if you don't know local attitudes, asking people you trust locally or asking your fam host family. If you're on a like a provide or a program with a partner on the ground, asking them. Um, you can always connect with us as, as well, and we can look into resources. Um, our health and safety team, in particular, would be able to look into those kind of resources for you. And then. Um, I also included a link to tips in general, which can kind of talk about um, how you kind of ease into that conversation with people you're not sure how they may react in a way that's going to be as safe as possible to you. Ren shared, um, I'm trans and when I was living in Russia, it wasn't always safe to be out, but I still wanted to be true to myself. So to get around the gender language problem, I'd say, for example, I'm from the US rather than I'm American which would be gendered. It was easier for me linguistically too as a language learner than navigating learning additional set of pronouns, at least at first. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And these are just some resources uh, that we included, some of the articles that we had read and looked up. Uh, I believe the article that I was talking about earlier is that second bullet point. Uh, and uh, lastly, the RLL gender resources. Uh, so the Romance Language and Literatures Department created a gender resource. And uh, when you check out that link, it actually has resources on um, some gender neutral terms for uh, Catalan, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, so that might be a good place to start too, if you're interested in those languages and pursuing um, that. Yeah, there's a lot of lecturers and faculty on campus who are doing research on this. So um, if it's something that you're interested and you want to talk to someone before you travel, they may be really great resources as well. Um, I don't know, Stephen and Callie, if when you were doing research, a lot of the really helpful like articles I found were from blogs of activists. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people doing podcasts now. So that can really give you um, a real life, like in, like in these people's shoes, representation of what's going on in your potential host country as well. I would like to introduce the next CGIS brief. We're doing them monthly now instead of bi-weekly. Um, so we're going to be talking about sustainable travel and our impact on Thursday, February 17th at 3 p.m. at the same link. So we do have a comment from Blake. Hi everyone, I'm Blake, I'm trans, I teach French in RLL, and I'm a member of the RLL Gender Diversity Working Group. We're trying to ensure that gender neutral language is available in all romance language classes. Feel free to email me if you have questions and I will keep, I will try to help or to put you in contact with someone else who can help if I can't. Thanks Blake for sharing that, that's really helpful, especially mm -hmm. for our students traveling to um, countries that speak romance languages. And that is really good to know. Um, we can actually add that kind of information to our website. Oh, we yeah. have a question. Oh, do you want, should I read it? I'll read it. <laughs> How well <laughs> or not are these non-gendered forms understood in various countries? Yeah, I think this goes back to the equality of movements and you, perhaps you can compare it here in the U.S., you know, things are very slow moving and it could be, you know, regional, it could be specific to the space you're in, like universities, typically people do understand uh, inclusivity, but if you travel to a small town, it may be more challenging to explain it or young folks or more liberal folks may understand the inclusive language a little bit better. Um, so being able to, you know, compare how it is here in the U.S. could give you a context um, internationally as well. I just dropped a link from one of the resources page. It just gives an example of how seven countries are kind of working on it. But like, yeah, to what you're saying, like a lot of it is going to come from researching and seeing what each country is doing um, to adopt that kind of inclusive language. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's not traditionally what you might expect. Um, so I think people generally like would key in as like European countries are going to be the most friendly and things like that. But I think Ashton was mentioning actually in a conversation before um, that Argentina was actually doing a better job um, with um, like um, they them gender inclusivity um, than like Spain was. And, um, you know, another example is like Poland. Poland is really, really homophobic. And I would not really anticipate that to be a country that's going to be super accepting and things like that, even it's even though it's a European country. So I, it really does get into like kind of like those particulars of the countries that uh, you'll see that the variance is like really all over the place. Mm -hmm.